Hello, welcome everyone to the IEA Bioenergy webinar hosted by ETA Florence Renewable Energies. My name is Chiara Benetti and I will be kicking off today's session. Today we have the pleasure to have Ed de Jong, Vice President Development Renewable Chemistries at Aventum, who will present on Bio-Based Chemicals, a 2020 status update. The session will be moderated by Bert Annebeling, Senior Scientist Biomass Chains at Bergeningen University and Research, Food and Bio-Based Research. I will now pass over to Bert, who will begin today's, today's session and will introduce today's uh, speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chiara, for your uh, kind introduction. You've said almost everything I wanted to say for my introduction, but uh, welcome to everybody at this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Bert Anneflink, and uh, I'm working indeed at Wageningen Food and Biobased Research, but I'm also the uh, new task leader of the IA Bioenergy Task 42, which is called uh, Biorefining in a Circular Economy. This used to be called uh, biorefining in a future bioeconomy, and uh, that's what you will see uh, on the slides of Ed Young because this report was actually planned in the previous uh, triennium. The title of uh, this webinar is uh, indeed the same as a recent uh, report of uh, Task 42, and you can find that on our website, and uh, Ed has included a link to this website on his uh, final sheet. So Ed de Jong uh, is actually, he was also working at Wageningen Food and Biobased Research, uh, but in uh, 2007, he joined uh, Avantium Chemicals, uh, where he is now indeed uh, Vice President uh, Development and Renewable uh, Chemistry. And he has also been always connected to the IEA uh, Bioenergy Task 42. Uh, so he has a long hi history at uh, our task. He was a co-founder of the task. Um, just some remarks about uh, this session. So we will now uh, we will have the presentation of Ed, but during the presentation you can use uh, what you see as a presenter, uh, sorry, as a as a chat box for everybody, and there you can uh, put in your questions, and then I will hopefully see. Uh, uh, then I will uh, see these questions. I get a remark now that you cannot hear me, but uh, I hope. This doesn't count for everybody. Um, but I see a lot of people. Oh, connection is good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so questions during the, we don't have to question during the uh, presentation, but please write them in the chat box. And then in the end, I will uh, try to uh, filter out uh, or get, get the main questions and try to moderate these questions. And, and at the end, we also have a question to you where you can uh, predict uh, something, but that will be at the end. So, uh, Ed, if you are ready, then I would like to give the floor to you for the presentation, which will take about uh, probably uh, 45 minutes, and then we have some time for questions at the end. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Ed Young speaking here. I hope uh, you can all hear me well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Chara and Bert for their kind introductions. And uh, I, say, I think uh, I will now uh, start uh, my presentation. Um, so on the second uh, slide, you can see uh, more or less uh, the content of this talk this afternoon. Uh, I will uh, briefly introduce the Bioenergy Task 42. Um, I will uh, introduce you to bio-based chemicals and um, especially also give some emphasis to uh, the sustainable development scenarios which are uh, developed uh, within uh, IEA. And uh, we have really um, made some uh, um, remarks in relation to the bio-based chemicals. Um, how important is a technology pool or a market pool to get this all going? Um, then we do a, a brief overview of all the biobased chemicals and producers. Um, I will discuss a bit uh, 
which you the dilemma of the drop-ins versus the novel uh, building blocks. I think again, quite relevant today uh, and, and yesterday after this uh, gigantic drop in the uh, uh, oil price, uh, what really shows again the, um, the how how sensitive uh, uh, bio-based uh, building blocks are compared to oil-based. Um, and I will I will wrap up this. Uh, uh, with a short analysis uh, and some conclusions. So, um, what is now uh, biorefining? Um, and so, uh, basically, uh, we came up a, a while ago with, uh, with a definition, and that's the sustainable processing of biomass in the portfolio of marketable bio based products, both. Uh, uh, food and feed ingredients, chemicals, materials, fuels, energies, minerals, and, and carbon dioxide, as well as bioenergy, fuels, power, and heat. And so you can see that um, a lot of the processing of biomass we, we do actually fulfills uh, this, uh, this definition. If we look at... Um, how we can really in 2050 become a really uh, circular bioeconomy, um, then basically we have uh, uh, a couple of ways of, of, of recycling and reuse. Um, so renewable uh, resources will uh, supply the, the carbon, that will uh, generate an array of, of, of different uh, products, and uh, the waste we can directly reuse recycle it to, uh, to materials and build chemicals, of course, all the way back to, uh, to uh, CO2 and, and novel renewable resources. I think that exemplified a bit better on, the, on this slide. And um, so in a truly circular world, I mean, we have three ways of, of really recycling carbon that can be done by uh, plant-based and then uh, glucose is uh, one of the major uh, building blocks. It can be air-based carbon, and then we are talking uh, about CO2 mainly. And it can, of course, also be uh, man-made, and we, we call that repurpose, and so that we do uh, recycling, uh, both mechanical and chemical recycling, and together that will enable uh, a circular economy. Um, the exact uh, amounts of each pillar to the total uh, picture is at the moment still still unclear, um, but uh, it is uh, likely that uh, the plant-based and the air-based uh, route still um, should uh, supply um, a substantial part of the total carbon um, in a truly circular economy. So, uh, if you look at uh, the, the chemical industry, um, and then uh, it, it is uh, quite clear that, that, I mean, in general, we only have a, a six year, um, so uh, that, that we have a limit uh, until we spend all the, uh, the carbon budget. Um, currently, uh, over 90% of all the chemical products we are using are still derived from, from fossil carbon. And this excludes flu, uh, fuels. And so um, you have to keep in mind that in my presentation, I also give some emphasis to, to ethanol. And that is then excluded of this, this calculation. Um, but I mean, 90%, I mean, it, it's, it's so that's a, a gigantic kind of challenge. And at the same time, um, we also expect that, that there will still be a substantial growth of the plastic market from now till uh, 2050. Although that might not be uh, desired, I mean, it will be very difficult to see how uh, the development, uh, developing economies in, in Asia and Africa, et cetera, can really um, um, uh, do so without really uh, increasing their, their the amount of plastic usage. So it is, uh, we, we see both a substantial increase in, uh, in, uh, in total volumes of, of plastics and then directly correlated with that bio-based chemicals. And at the same time, um, 
we, we have this in, enormous challenge of, of going from 90% uh, fossil to eventually 0% fossil. Um, so that uh, is setting the, the, the scope. And um, yeah, in this presentation, we will uh, uh, give you more um, uh, details on uh, uh, the current situation. Uh, we start here with the picture of uh, the uh, oil price. Um, now, as you can see, I haven't included the, the latest drop again, uh, because then we are back again be, uh, below 30. Um, and that shows, uh, I, mean, I mean, two things. I mean, one is actually that um, um, around 2010, in that area, I mean, a lot of the business cases were were, were built on uh, oil prices around $100. Uh, uh, and um, now the last five, six years were more based on, on around $50 per, uh, a ton. But I mean, the um, volatility of the prices is, 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 is just as harmful as, as the absolute price. I mean, the absolute price, I mean, um, Sometimes, I mean, you can uh, have business cases which, which can survive at, at 50. Um, but at, at the same time, I mean, if you have those those kind of uh, drops uh, below 30 and they um, are in place for uh, some prolonged time, I mean, uh, almost all the uh, business cases uh, will fail if you have a drop in. So this volatility also makes it uh, much more difficult then to, to finance uh, this kind of industries and and this this kind of industries need a lot of money because they are all very um, capex uh, capital expenditure intensive. So um, this this volatility of your oil price uh, in general is is very bad on in the developing of this novel industry. So um, this is just uh, as a comparison uh, the the. Uh, the prices of some uh, commodities. I mean, we have here grains and uh, oil, oil uh, seeds and meals. And, and what you can see is that also, I mean, there is some um, uh, some following of the drop in the uh, in the oil price, in the drop in the commodity pricing. But at the same time, I think um, it's pretty obvious that uh, the range is much smaller than uh, the drop in the oil price. So um, this shows you that. Although they are a bit related, I mean, you can clearly see that um, uh, the, uh, the cost position of the bio-based materials uh, uh, hasn't improved over the last uh, uh, couple of years, but has actually worsened compared to the, to the oil price. Um, another point that will be stressed later also is, is that basically, I mean, the... Um, the um, Oil is completely reduced, doesn't contain a lot of oxygen. So um, in general, during processing and converting into chemicals, I mean, the weight is increased. While um, this biomass, I mean, the biomass contains already quite a, a bit of oxygen. So during processing, um, only in a few cases, actually, the, the weight is increased. In some cases, I mean, the weight uh, remains the same, and that, that's already pretty good. But in some extreme cases, I mean, you, you lose a lot of weight. I mean, one of the most extreme examples, of course, is the conversion of um, glucose uh, via ethanol into acetylene. And you can see then, basically, you get two molecules of acetylene from one molecule of, uh, of glucose. And uh, I mean, the, the mass goes from, uh, uh, goes all the way down to, uh, yeah, 48, so you lose uh, more than two-thirds of your weight already by converting that. So that all together shows you that um, um, uh, a low oil price is, is very difficult to, to handle for the buyers and issues. So why do we still want um, a bio-based uh, chemicals in the, and certainly also in conjunction with, with bioenergy and the biorefining? Um, yeah, to, to certainly uh, to, to supply the market with sustainable uh, and renewable chemicals. Um, 
in, in quite a few cases also it can improve the economics of the bioenergy production yeah, because um, uh, another outlet quite often of, of, of side streams is uh, the production of, uh, um, of, of bioenergy for example and if you can really um, add a uh, more valuable product stream I mean that can really improve your business case um, uh, I mean what are quite a few examples there that you can actually make use of existing industrial infrastructure. Uh, what is especially interesting, for example, in um, for example in Europe, where um, because of um, economies of scale, some of the the smaller size uh, plants uh, become um, uh, redundant. Uh, quite often. Um, uh, part or whole of the plant can be used actually for some uh, bio-based uh, uh, chemical production and that can really uh, yeah, decrease quite substantially the, uh, the capital uh, um, uh, expenditures. And not only that, but I mean, if you can do that really also with still the, uh, the personnel in place, I mean, it can also really um, buy you uh, uh, a lot of, of knowledge on on, uh, on on chemistries which are uh, when chemistries are comparable and I, I think that is also a quite invaluable thing to to use existing uh, industry infrastructure um, uh, scaling up becomes also easier because uh, a plant uh, quite also other uh, often is already commercial at a, at a small scale um, what can be the case is really that you create a, a unique uh, functionality. Um, examples there are, for example, lactic acid, uh, succinic acid, and dicarboxylic acid. That are molecules which are um, not or not easily uh, produced from uh, from chemical uh, fossil feedstocks, and um, have have molecule. Uh, 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 functionality which is unique and which, which can really uh, be beneficial in uh, this kind of applications. Um, of course, depending on the on the lifetime of the chemical, you, you also have a medium term CO2 storage and, uh, and you can of course reduce the non-renewable energy usage. So, uh, market size of, of, of the chemicals is, is very big. Um, uh, the bio-based chemicals is, is around 90 million tons, and um, the main molecules what we see is, is ethanol uh, um, as well as uh, fatty acid uh, derivatives. How do we uh, achieve um, uh, an increased uh, amount of, of bio-based uh, chemicals? I mean, should it be a pool or a push? I mean, of course. Um, governments can play a role there uh, um, by legislation uh, yeah, because as drivers, uh, sustainability, potential greenhouse gas savings, as well as also uh, security of supply, what certainly in the last couple of years uh, has, has risen uh, on the agenda in, in, uh, on, on several uh, continents. Um, so they can create a uh, uh, a push. Uh, I mean, they could also create a pool here. For example, in, in the US, you have to buy a preferred uh, program. So then, then also uh, a pool can, can be created by government. Um, technology push. Uh, I mean, you see uh, uh, a lot of uh, developments uh, at universities, institutes, as well as, uh, as companies. Um, and um, Technically, I think uh, there is already uh, uh, a lot possible, and, and basically all the chemicals uh, you, you can think of can be, uh, in principle, made uh, produced from from biomass. Um, although uh, it has to be said that um, the business cases uh, among those uh, under those kind of uh, uh, technologies are not always sound. Um, we also, of course, have a, have a market pool. Um, 
that can be brand owners and uh, and certainly also uh, consumers. And we come back to that uh, a bit later. And this is an example just uh, rather randomly about um, some major players worldwide and and how they want to uh, to go to uh, to buy based alternatives. Um, and the approach might differ a bit, but uh, uh, it, it seems that that it starts to be really well uh, uh, grounded within the companies to to achieve that. And it is not, um, as, as far as I can can judge, uh, just just kind of uh, window washing uh, or green washing of, of the companies, but it is a honestly felt uh, desire to. Uh, to, to become uh, become more circular and uh, quite a few companies uh, notice that to really become that it is more than just recycling but also uh, having uh, a bio-based compound component in there. Now if you see what are the, the, the capacities, I mean uh, this is just an, an overview I think um, of um, uh, 2018 what is uh, uh, produced by uh, European Bioplastics in, in, in collaboration with the NOVA Institute. Uh, and what you can see here on, on this graph is that, I mean, the total uh, uh, amount is, is, is still relatively limited uh, um, uh, to 2 million tons. Uh, um, just to give you an idea, I mean, uh, just uh, PET already is is over 60 million tons, and so um, it, it is small. Um, and you can also see there is a kind of uh, almost equal um, uh, diversion between, um, say, bio-based plastics and uh, biodegradable plastics. Um, so the uh, bio-based plastics can be uh, completely uh, identical to the fossil-based as well as the bio-based PE and, and PET, but it can also uh, be having novel functionalities, for example, like uh, PEF. And if you see the biodegradable ones, I mean, that are also a combination of uh, uh, things which can be completely, um, uh, can be uh, fossil-based or, or and in the majority, they are they're all bio, bio based of also based identical, like like PBAT. If we look at the gross scenarios, then then we see that the the gross is is still. Uh, I mean, there is there's projected growth for the upcoming years, but it is it's quite limited. A um, couple of hundred thousand tons uh, are coming on stream in the uh, in the upcoming years. So um, within task 42, uh, we also uh, looked at, uh, at the classification of, of this kind of biorefineries. And um, basically, we uh, defined it as, a, um, uh, as four components uh, which are needed to really describe a, a biorefinery. I mean, we have the feedstocks. I mean, they are here depicted in green on the top of the, of the figure. We have um, um, conversion processes uh, here in, in yellow. Uh, and conversion processes are in general needed um, uh, at, at two levels. First, to convert the feedstock into the uh, platform. And the platform is the third kind of denominator. And that is basically the the basic building block uh, where you can really then convert it further to the products which are in blue. And so we go from feedstocks via conversion steps to platforms via conversion steps in general to products. Um, so the platforms are, are quite important, uh, uh, I would say, containers for, uh, for bio-based uh, materials. Now, if you now look um, the, at the current status, then um, uh, we have defined quite a few uh, platforms, and, and this list is, is, like a, is certainly not, not complete. Uh, but um, if we are now really looking to uh, what is 
commercially used for uh, for biobased chemicals, then basically there are only two platforms with a substantial amount of uh, uh, of uh, uh, um, capacity, and that is the uh, C six, so the glucose. Uh, uh, or also a bit fructose uh, super platform, uh, as well as say the uh, the plant-based oil platform, and those two really make up for the majority of the of the biogas. Um, if you look at scenarios, uh, I mean, uh, then uh, uh, we see here um, uh, a picture. Uh, from, uh, from IEA on uh, the, the, the future um, of uh, uh, the uh, uh, energy uh, demand um, and basically the the green circle um, uh, no, 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 sorry the gray circle is uh, the the current um, uh, amount and the the size of the circle is is, is the amount and the uh, and you can see that um, the total amount has increased quite a bit since 1990. And then depending on the different scenarios, um, we see that uh, it is anticipated that the total amount will increase further, but that the energy-related CO2 emissions can reduce, but that we there really need there a sustainable development scenario for that. And if we don't do that, then we will see that also the uh, CO2 emissions will still uh, still increase further. And of course, that is something we all want to, to mitigate. Now, from a biochemicals point of view, we have really uh, discussed uh, what kind of things uh, are, are needed um, to, to really um, uh, make this possible. Um, and of course, I mean, you can debate on the, on the actual numbers, etc. But, but certainly we think that a, a high CO2 price uh, is necessary. Also, that we, we stop really um, subsidizing the, the, the fossil industry. Um, that we, that we uh, sequester uh, CO2. Um, that the circular economy is actually mandatory. And, uh, and that we do a sustainable forestry and agriculture. But also that we have high progress in, uh, in in technology, especially the up and downstream processes need need quite a bit of in improvement. Things like ethanol to chemicals uh, needs uh, needs to take off further. Uh, hydrogen is important, as well as we think that uh, marine um, uh, biomass such as algae and seaweed uh, needs uh, wider uh, utilization. But also on the social side, I mean, we need uh, quite a bit of, uh, of change. Uh, so um, as, a, as a starting point, we need high acceptance of climate threat and for uh, climate policy. And um, if, we, if we get that, um, then also uh, uh, a broad agreement on biomass sustainability and biodiversity uh, is needed, a willingness to, to change behavior. Um, a willingness also to pay for climate-friendly products, um, an open attitude to locations of facility, and uh, yeah, I think also less demand demand is quite uh, quite important because that frees up quite a bit of feedstock also uh, for this uh, this kind of, uh, uh, transition. And um, yeah, so. Uh, what, what are then some of the consequences? Uh, so, um, so we think that that there should be uh, much higher prices for greenhouse gas intensive projects. Um, we should uh, also come to um, uh, a completely renewable uh, electricity. Uh, feedstock availability, I think. Um, um, no restrictions should, should be there as long as um, the feedstock is uh, complying to the uh, earlier mentioned uh, uh, requirements. Um, I think, uh, 
And if you look at the industries, I mean, we really need uh, bio-based chemicals uh, for all chemical products, uh, large-scale lignocellulosic utilization, uh, and uh, also an extensive use of drop-in chemicals from biomass for existing industries, as well as uh, 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 biogenic CO2 conversion to chemicals. So, in the following uh, tables, we will discuss a bit um, the, uh, the, the the status. I will go uh, through it uh, quite quite rapidly. Um, uh, what Bert was already uh, indicating. I mean, we have now uh, put uh, the updated uh, report online, and in the end, you can find a, a table and and really look for yourself. Uh, to, to what uh, what the status is of the different uh, chemicals, uh, which companies are involved, uh, is it uh, is it gross or pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so um, we have organized it based on the amount of carbon atoms uh, there. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, a last disclaimer, I mean, the, the field is quite dynamic, so uh, uh, this, this table is certainly not not complete, and uh, there might already be be some changes since uh, since we uh, prepared this table. Uh, so um, in this uh, for for the uh, presentation, I, I didn't really uh, uh, put into the table also the uh, the the capacities uh, there. Um, now, what what can be mentioned actually is that that ethanol is 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 really dominating now uh, the biobased chemicals, and of course, I mean ethanol is is mainly used uh, nowadays as a, as a fuel additive. Um, but uh, in, in this uh, aspect, I mean, we certainly like to uh, to mention that. Uh, comp uh, Molecules like acetylene and acetylene gly glycol and acetylene oxide are all produced via ethanol. And so, actually, real biobased chemicals are actually uh, uh, produced via ethanol. Quantities are still relatively small compared to the uh, total amount of ethanol produced, uh, but, but it shows you that, that ethanol certainly is an example of, of a biobased chemical. Uh, Continuing here, I mean, so some of the important ones, of course, uh, lactic acid as a um, bio-based uh, polymer with, with unique uh, functionality, um, but also uh, one stream propane diol, uh, I mean, produced by Dupont and, uh, and Tate and Lyle and, and used in the uh, polymer uh, Sorona has, has a very uh, uh, important uh, market share. Uh, other things are, for, for, of course, propylene glycol, uh, um, produced uh, now uh, commercially by ADM. Now, just to give you one extra information here, yes, yeah, so if the uh, companies are in italic, then it means that they are still in demonstration phase. And if they are just uh, uh, normal written down, then they have uh, commercial production uh, going on. So, uh, continuing, uh, we see that, uh, um, that, that on the next place, I mean, we, we, we see a couple of uh, um, higher uh, molecular mass compounds, such as uh, succinic acid and um, uh, um, I will stop for a brief moment because in the room next to me is me, somebody Speaking very loud, I will just ask him to shut up. Sorry. Uh, the guys uh, should speak a little bit uh, less loud. But. Um, 
Yeah, so here uh, on, on this slide, I mean, I think important ones are furfural already uh, a well established bio based compound and, and xylitol. Uh, and, the, and the last slide uh, shows you some, uh, some other ones uh, like sorbitol and lysine and citric acid, which are known ones, uh, but also newly uh, developed uh, molecules like FDCA, uh, HMF, and uh, uh, in the other ones, the uh, dicarbolic citric acids and uh, the pyroxylin. So, what what are important uh, criteria for for product commercialization? Yeah, I mean, and um, I mean, of course, I could really have a, a presentation only on this uh, this slide here because I mean, it, it really um, is very important that 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 you look into a lot of detail in in in, in this 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 table to to assess if if. A, a certain development is um, is working or not for for you. Uh, so market fundamentals, features of availability and price, uh, utilities availability and price, um, product profitability, competitive nature of the market, need for partnerships, downstream development opportunities. Uh, so um, a lot of it uh, you can call as industrial symbiosis. Uh, I mean. If 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 your um, operation fits in a certain uh, place, I mean the profitability of the overall uh, and therefore can be tremendously increased. Um, uh, also, if you look at the technology, uh, I mean it is it is really important to look at commercial experience, bankability, and uh, the necessary capital investment, process complexity, access to technology, and environmental. Uh, considerations. Um, now, we, we discussed a lot already a, a bit in the, in the beginning about a drop-in versus new functionality. Um, now, what is a drop-in? That is basically an identical molecule than uh, what is derived from fossil-based uh, feedstock, only made from, from bio-based. And in this table, we have a couple of examples. For example, uh, acetic acid, uh, dipic acid, and butanol and acetylene, uh, biomech. Um, and um, the, what is now the advantage or the disadvantage of, of a drop-in versus a molecule with new functionality? Um, uh, that can, can be seen on, on, on this slide. Uh, um, in general, uh, the drop-in has a very high market accept acceptance uh, because the, the the partners in the value chain already know how to uh, to work with it. Also, the, the speed of introduction can be much, much quicker. Um, uh, in general, there's a good fit with existing infrastructure. Um, but, and that was mentioned already at the start of, the, of this talk, I mean, drop-ins are very sensitive for oil, price, uh, uh, oil prices and feedstock uh, prices. So um, if that goes the wrong uh, direction, I mean, basically you have a, a losing business case. Um, sustainability, um, of course, they really have to judge on um, each uh, individual case, um, but that's not always uh, automatically uh, good, uh, partly actually because um, what I discussed already before, um, uh, quite a few of those molecules are uh, much more uh, reduced and contain less oxygen, and therefore, actually, um, um, the overall um, efficiency of, of the con conversion of uh, um, um, biomass into uh, the chemicals is less. And so, uh, my my own. Uh, 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 perspective in the future is also that in on the longer term we will uh, move um, to to different classes of, of, of molecules. Uh, if you look at in from the plastic point of view, and uh, we will go more to polyesters and polyamides and move away from the polyolefins, also because the recyclability of polyesters and polyamides is 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 is, is more easy. Uh, uh, if you look at the unique marketplace, of course. Um, the bio-based uh, 
proteins don't have a, a unique marketplace while the unique molecules have them. That makes them less uh, susceptible for, for example, changes in, 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 in oil prices. Uh, scalability, of course, uh, needs to be proven with novel molecules. Um, and uh, also legislation um, can be more cumbersome uh, with novel molecules. So in that respect, a, a quite an, uh, a diverse uh, picture. And I think if you look over the past uh, decade, you see that there, uh, 10 years ago, there was uh, a lot of appetite for drop-ins. And, and over the last couple of years, we see um, certainly uh, a renewed interest in, in more the unique uh, molecules. Uh, this is just uh, to show you a bit about um, the amount of uh, uh, ethanol that is produced. And then you see this is in gallons. Huh? Uh, you see the immense amount of what actually the uh, United States nowadays produces huh? because, I mean, uh, 20 years ago, uh, Brazil was still the dominant player, and I mean, they're completely taken over by, by the US. So that also shows you that um, if, if really the, the instruments are right and the, uh, and the, the, the political climate is, 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 uh, is facilitating, I mean, you can, in relatively short time, really increase um, a lot of uh, capacity So uh, to, to finalize this talk a bit, uh, some, uh, um, some remarks uh, uh, regarding the strengths, the weaknesses, and the opportunities and, and threats uh, here for virus chemicals. Uh, so one of the major uh, strengths is really that, we, that you add value to the use of biomass. Um, and you, you're maximizing also the conversion or minimize the uh, material requirements. Um, you can actually produce a spectrum of, of, of products and, and, and sometimes also move a bit to uh, the different uh, outlets depending on, on the demand. Um, there is a strong knowledge infrastructure and also biorefinery is not new, but I mean, it builds on really the food agriculture and the uh, uh, forestry industries. Um, some weaknesses, I mean, it is still a bit undefined and unclassified. Um, you need uh, the involvement uh, of stakeholders of different market sectors, so uh, who were not used to uh, to talk with each other, and certainly we're talking about the agri and uh, the egg and forestry industries, and for example, the energy and chemical industries. Um, it is still not, uh, it's in, in development, so the, the, the most promising biorefinery processes are still uh, uh, not clear. Uh, the same is also uh, about the uh, uh, most promising value chains. Uh, the last one uh, we discussed already uh, um, a couple of times, and I think also the one above, the variability of quality and energy density of biomass. I mean, um, a lot of the biomass, uh, what is used in, 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 in biorefineries are not considered commodities yet. So there is still some, quite some variability there. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, I think uh, I'm running a little bit out of time, so I will go a bit uh, quick over the last two slides, uh, but I mean, you, you can read later yourself on, on the slides, but um, uh, things we have already mentioned, for example, is in strong demand of the brand owners, um, and that we also see a little bit of change in the uh, spectrum of, uh, um, uh, of what, what is needed. So more proteins compared to carbohydrates, so carbohydrates can easily be used for the biobased chemicals. Um, but at the same time, there are certainly also threats, uh, the fossil fuel prices. Um, um, uh, we also see that the implementation of other renewable energy technologies feeding the market request. Uh, um, 
What we also have seen quite often is that the biobased products and the bioenergy are assessed uh, to a higher standard than traditional projects, so no level playing field. Um, availability and contactability of raw materials, uh, and uh, certainly in race to climate change. Uh, changing governmental policies, I mean, I think we all know that that can happen. Um, questioning of, of the sustainability of the uh, biomass production. Uh, and uh, yeah, end users are often focused on a single product while a biorefinery is actually producing a multitude of products, what makes it sometimes difficult. So to make some conclusions, huh, um, um, bio-based chemicals are essential to come to a circular uh, bioeconomy. Um, the biobased chemicals uh, are currently only only slowly expanding. Um, only in a few cases, products are market competitive without subsidies at current oil prices. Um, currently, there is more traction for new functionality molecules than for drop-in molecules. Um, and yeah, we have also discussed that multiple actions are needed to. to uh, to, to, to achieve this uh, sustainable development uh, scenario. So I thank you all for your attention, and I think we have some time for, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for discussion. Okay, thank you, Ed. Uh, I hope everybody hears me. What you already see on the screen is now the question we ask, are asking you. Um, I have a question to Giar. Can everybody see it if I scroll my list or is that's only visible for me? Only for you. Only for me. Okay, then then uh, Ed, I will scroll the list because we have several, uh, we have many questions actually. I would say uh, some 15 or something. I'll read the question to you, Ed, and then perhaps you can give a, a short answer. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, to answer the questions, and it and the questions go uh, more or less uh, uh, parallel to your uh, slides. So the first question is uh, uh, a bit uh, technical about uh, bioplastics and uh, being uh, degradable, non-degradable. I think that was already answered by one of the participants. Sorry that I skipped this one. Um, and a question from guest one, what do you mean with no restrict restrictions to first generation? Will food versus fuel discussion not be valid for bio-based chemicals? Ed, what is your opinion about that question? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, of course, I mean, it, it, it's a good question. Um, personally, I think um, certainly in, in the Western world, um, um, we we are not um, um, we we need uh, uh, good nutrients such as proteins, uh, fatty acids, minerals, but not so much uh, the carbohydrates. So um, we see already, for example, a move um, uh, in Europe had that, that uh, um, the um, uh, phyto wheat gluten, what you can make from wheat, are, are, are very, a very desired um, uh, component, uh, especially for older elderly food, uh, food as well as for sport foods. And that will re result basically that there is an, um, uh, an uh, over uh, supply of, 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 the, uh, of the starch, what is in, in, in the wheat. And the starch can then very well be used for. Um, uh, for uh, bio-based chemicals, uh, for example. So um, I think in that respect, um, it is the discussion food versus feed is, is, is often too simplistic. Um, and I think also um, uh, in the end, I mean, we, we really should, um, if you look at the amount of food, uh, feed what is need for, uh, need for meat, and then, then also that should take in, be taken in the, in the, um, in the discussion. And so um, I don't think that by just saying um, uh, we want to use uh, only uh, first generation uh, for for food and feed and, and not for bio-based chemicals, um, that that would go in the in the wrong direction. Also, if you uh, it it is also another argument there is basically I mean if there is a calamity before world. Uh, 
uh, a severe drought that what reduces the production of uh, of uh, first generation feedstocks. Um, if you use part of that for biobased chemicals, you have uh, in potential the the option to to change at that moment uh, to to food and feed. While you would, if you would use the same land for uh, production of uh, of lignocellulosic biomass, for example, then you cannot change that. So. I think in that respect, I mean, we should look at it much more holistic and not really making a kind of simplistic things that that that, that uh, first generation should only go to uh, to food and feed, and second generation is a, is a preferentially for uh, for biobased chemicals. Okay, thanks. Uh, second question is from Liliana Gamba. If you have data on the main feedstocks currently being used for biobased chem. Uh, the main feedstocks, um, at, 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 at currently it is, uh, the majority is still uh, um, from the sugars, it is uh, in, in, in um, North America, it is corn, it's in uh, South America, it's, uh, it's mainly uh, sugarcane, and in Europe, uh, it's a bit of combination, but uh, uh, a lot is wheat with, with some, uh, also some corn and, and sugar beet. So um, that, that is from the sugar side. So uh, the amount of, of second generation uh, or lignocellulosic kind of feedstock is, is very limited still. And I think, uh, yeah, the recent examples in, uh, in the US have shown that it is very difficult to, uh, uh, to get easily uh, a uh, profitable bis business case. I mean, there are a couple of projects underway in Europe now, also like Clariant, as, as an example, uh, as well as Amy, who are developing uh, plants. Um, and um, yeah, we have to see. But I mean, it, it takes longer uh, than than initially anticipated. If we look at that from the um, uh, uh, triglycerides, so the fatty acids. Um, I mean, that is, uh, for a major part, still based on, um, yeah, depending on the location, of course, but I mean, in, in Asia, it is palm oil, in, in Europe, it is uh, um, rapeseed, uh, uh, there is some oil, soy oil, uh, canola, and so th that are the major feedstock uh, used nowadays, and um, so, the, for example, in the fatty acids, the, the newer uh, streams uh, like from algae, etc. I mean, there is some applications there, but it is still very limited, and, and mainly really for the uh, uh, the high end specialty uh, uh, fatty acids, which can be produced by those um, kind of organisms, and not yet for bulk. Okay, thanks. Uh, then there is a question of Edwin Birkens, and he's is asking if in the biobased chemicals overview. Does the IEA only consider uh, on-purpose production, or on, or also what he calls mass-balanced production, like for example, Basef, Dow, Serbik as well? And then the discussion goes on a bit, but I cannot. Uh, in I, I, I can make a couple of remarks. Um, um, we, we 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 discussed the mass-balanced approach. Um, uh, but it is very difficult at the moment there to really get um, um, data on, 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 on the amounts, how significant that is. Um, and we also see, for example, I, I saw another one, um, uh, like, for example, uh, in the Nesta uh, process, I mean, uh, they, they now produce uh, propane from, uh, from the glycerol part of, the, of their, uh, their feedstock. Uh, what is then... Um, Purified as an as a as a as a pure chemical, uh, so um, we have only looked really like uh, like in it, uh, to individual molecules. Uh, so um, uh, the other part of the nested production we haven't taken into uh, to consideration, but the um, the, uh, the glycerol to propane uh, conversion uh, we we did uh, discuss. And, and Edwin has another question, is like, uh, and that is, uh, there's a lot of ethanol capacity for fuel. And uh, what have been the main hurdles for ethanol to chemicals? 
um, and, and somebody remarks already that this probably costs, but. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, this this cost. Uh, uh, and combined this cost, it is also really, uh, say, market demand uh, from uh, from uh, end users. Okay. And, uh, and so, uh, I mean, and that is also related to cost. I mean, which which partners really are 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 willing to. Uh, to, to pay a bit more for uh, for a bio-based uh, alternative. Okay, then we have a question of Jacob Kuggerman. Uh, the electrification of uh, trans the transport sector leads to a decreasing demand for crude oil. The oil price therefore will remain low probably. So do bio-based chemicals have a chance against this? Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, we, we can always see that the oil price partly is, is artificially uh, driven, yes? I mean, if you look at, so, um, and, and that it, it is partly done by producers, what can they get from it? But it is also really also uh, dependent on, on, on taxation and those kind of things. And in the end, I mean, the, the, the interesting question is really also uh, uh, if, if the, um, output of a, of a refinery uh, or the demand for the different products of a refinery will change. Eh? So, I mean, the, the major part goes, of course, to, uh, to um, the transportation fuels eh? and um, how much of the other uh, uh, products from a refinery are can still be uh, produced cost effectively. Uh, but I think in the longer term, um, the, the big question is, are we really uh, uh, willing to go to a sustainable uh, society and, and uh, because I mean of course there is still quite a bit of um, of oil there uh, um, but the question is really I mean uh, is it better than to use all the oil and at the same time do a lot of CCS or uh, do we come up to, for another uh, sustainable um, uh, solution and I think, I mean, we can go into a, quite a, uh, a long debate there what, what, uh, where the world will go. And it might actually be that in the end an, uh, a solution will come up that we haven't thought about it yet. But um, uh, it, it looks logic actually to, uh, to, uh, to avoid um, uh, on the longer term really costly oil extraction. Yeah? Because, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean... Of course, um, there still will be, be oil available, but I mean, um, it will be uh, at much uh, greater cost and also greater risk to, to extract it. Yes, I mean, uh, for example, what now are the, uh, the benefits and drawbacks of shale gas and shale oil um, uh, will be proven in the upcoming decades, yes? And uh, uh, not to mention, for example, uh, Oil extraction from the Arctic, uh, as well as the Terzans, etc. And I think um, also the 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 event, potential environmental burden will be become too big for for companies to really invest in that. I mean, because I mean, in the end, um, uh, I think they will uh, they will become liable, and um, that will be also for investors will be a, a too big a risk to to go in the longer term. So. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there will be enough oil, but it will be economically, uh, on the longer term, yeah. not interesting to, to keep on using it. Okay, Ed, uh, we have two more questions, if you still have time and if the audience still has time. Uh, the first one is from Lori Hamlin, uh, and she says, it's a long question. As an LCA practitioner, one critic I often got is that our bio-based versus petrochemical bio-based comparisons uh, petrochemical based comparisons are unfair for the bio base due to the very poor quality, non transparent of life cycle inventory data we have uh, for petrochemical chemicals and plastics. Have you seen progress in that direction? For example, Plastic Europe more open to supply transparent data sets? Question mark. That's a good question. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not an LCA uh, practitioner. I mean, I, I work. Together with quite a few of the of the leading uh, players in, in Europe, 
Um, I mean, there are a couple of things. I mean, um, in general, what you do with uh, with, with fossil is, is is a lot of um, backwards looking. Huh? So you use data, um, for example, from the 90s from the uh, oil extraction in Saudi Arabia, huh? and I think then there needs to be a change that basically um, you should make a comparison uh, with to be developed kind of um, fossil feedstocks and not looking at the already established one. Huh? Because I mean, if you look at the risks uh, of, uh, uh, of of what I mentioned, uh, shale gas and shale oil, I mean that's completely different than than um, the, the 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 stuff you get from uh, Saudi Arabia. So I think that that needs to be changing. The other um, the other one is is really that. Um, Quite often, the uh, the chemical industry and the petrochemical industry only have some uh, the, the the best examples. Uh, so I mean, it, it, it's not really a fair comparison. And um, um, yeah, I think also uh, what is not really fair is that that basically calamities are not included in life cycle assessment. Uh, so uh, things like the deep uh, deep water horizon and, and those kind of uh, of things or for example if you're taking Nigeria etc I mean that's all not included in the life cycle assessment and uh, while um, you you can envision that those calamities are in a way are are more likely with with, with the fossil ones than with the bio based ones uh, so I think there there still needs a lot of um, improvement uh, in that area to uh, and I think the last remark on LCA, I mean, it's used on um, for two things. Yes? I mean, it, it can be very useful for for kind of hotspot analysis and to really see where in your process you you are uh, uh, are, are losing a lot of uh, of your environmental benefits or what 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 are the, the the places you you need improvements. And I think that that's very useful. And the other one is, of course, the U.S. to compare two different kind of products. And there, really, you need, uh, I think we, we need um, even improved kind of uh, uh, methodology. But I'm not the expert, certainly, to say. But, um, but from, from our side, I think we, we, we are looking forward to get there. Okay. Um, yeah. I see the question from Doris. Yes. Uh, what, what can I recommend for, for startups? Um, a lesson learned: developing novel molecules or drop-in uh, bio-based chemicals. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a very good question. Uh, I think at the moment, um, uh, novel molecules uh, does uh, uh, look more uh, interesting, um, but why I'm a little bit hesitating is also a, a bit on. Um, Say the the financing model, what is around that, and, and why do I say that? I mean, um, th these are quite uh, capital intensive uh, processes to develop, scale up, and, and bring to the market of, of novel molecules. And um, if you if you really want to to raise, uh, let's let's mention a decent number. Yes, I mean before you are commercial. I mean, you probably need quite often already 100 million uh, to, to really develop the whole process, demonstrate that on, on pilot scale, et cetera. Uh, and um, to be able to raise that money, I mean, there, there must be um, an, uh, a, a clear kind of, um, uh, yeah, bright horizon huh? so that you can really say, okay, this can be really an important molecule application but will change the world. And um, that is more easy, of course, with a drop-in than with a novel molecule, because with a novel molecule, you really still have to uh, develop the market and also uh, develop the offtake. Um, so, um, yes, the economics of, of a novel molecule are currently certainly better, but uh, it is not easier still to, to get it financed, because basically you, you cannot really prove in the beginning already that there will be a, um, a big market for that. Okay, and Ed, can you then also ask the, for answer the question of Anders uh, Nordin, uh, 
I skipped that indeed in the middle, but uh, can you read it? Or uh, if you have any comments about Total and partners uh, and the uh, interesting project uh, biofuel uh, demo, uh, large petrochemical scale feeding of biorefineries. And that's then really the last question. Uh. Yeah, no, yeah. Then it's a little bit of pity that I can uh, that that with this last question, I have to say that I'm not completely aware of the bio to fuel um, demo project. So, um, as Anders uh, gives me some information, I can uh, by email then I can uh, answer to to him uh, directly. But I mean, I, I cannot really do that here in uh, in the in the plenary session. Okay. Well. Then, Ed, uh, thank you very much for uh, the excellent presentation and all the answers. Uh, we uh, Perhaps uh, Chiara has some comments on uh, where the uh, recording, etc., and the PowerPoint will be placed. Uh, yes, um, thank you for your great presentation, um, Ed and Bert. Uh, that's bring the session to an end, let's say. Um, next webinar is scheduled on the 14th of May and will be focused on drivers for successful and sustainable biogas RNG projects, international perspectives. Uh, for all information on the next webinars and if you would like to listen to the recording of today's webinar and if you would like to download the webinar presentation as well, please visit www.ie eabioenergy.com. Um, the presentation and the recording will be available in the next few days. Thank you all for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, thank you all. Bye bye.